born and raised in small town in North Carolina. Tate Barkley's journey winds through poverty, addiction, a complex relationship with his biological father, and the constant effort to hide his identity. His story is one of survival and resilience, told against the backdrop of a society often indifferent and frequently outright hostile. His strength lies in overcoming his traumas, embracing his truth, and inspiring others to do the same. As we prepare to delve into our conversation on the topic at hand, the profound struggles and triumphs of gay men and women in the South, here is an exciting twist. We are going to tickle the brains of our guest Tate. So Tate, get ready for a rapid fire round of random words. I'll mention it. Okay. <laughs> okay, I would love to hear the very first thing that comes to your mind in response without thinking much. Are you ready for it? I'm ready. Go ahead, sir. Okay. All right. So here comes my uh, first uh, word. It is memory. Uh, thoughts. Gender. Daily. Invention. Uh, TV. Future. Is bright. Book. Uh, Sunday dinners, moonshine and men. <laughs> Nature. Mm-hmm. Uh, trees, beautiful trees, many of them. Movie. Theater. Food. Uh, oh my goodness, Mexican. Place. Uh, home. And last one is universe. Uh, Earth. All right. Thank you so much for participating in the rapid fire round of random words. Really uh, appreciate Thank you, Glenn. Did I get a hundred? We're not graded. <laughs> You're not graded. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it to the audience. <laughs> All right. Very good. Then. All right. I so hope I made a good grade. You made it. You made it. <laughs> so, uh, folks, welcome to the Guiding Voice podcast, please, where we embark on transformative conversations for a better future. I'm your host, Navin Samala, dedicated to making the world a better place through valuable discussions that add value not only to your life, but also to your career. Thank you so much for tuning in. And Tate, hearty welcome to The Guiding Voice. Thank you so much for being part of our journey. Well, thank you, Naveen. It's, it's my pleasure to be here and to be a part of The Guiding Voice. So I appreciate it very, very much. Yeah, pleasure to have you, uh, Tate. Let's uh, jump in. So I begin with the success mantra of the guest. So let mm-hmm. us talk about the top three things that have contributed to your success so far. I, I have to say, there are the three things that I believe that have contributed to my success so far. I think the first one has been the kindness of other people. And that is other people going out of their way to not only help me, but to help my family over the years. You know, one of the reasons that that, that I talk about service to others is that I have been the beneficiary of, of so many people helping me that did not have to help me. They weren't yeah. obligated to. Mm-hmm. They just did it uh, because they wanted to, because they were good people. Secondly, I would have to say that education, without doubt, was a huge contributor to my success. You know, I've practiced, I've been a practicing attorney for 32 years. And and, and and being able to be a part of a profession that allowed me to empower myself and others uh, was certainly a huge part of my success. So education, I, I am so grateful that I had the patience to stick with my education and to get my law degree. And I have to think that that certainly that's one of the second reasons. And I think the third the third reason for my success is that I, I, I've always tried to do the best I could. Even, even if I felt a little down on myself, even if I felt like the task was a little overwhelming, I always tried to do the best that I could by my clients, by my family, you know, mm-hmm. and, and by others, and even by myself sometimes, you know, and uh, I, I would have to say that's the third reason. Yeah, I need to appreciate you for acknowledging the kindness of other people, which is often taken for granted. But um, you have openly admitted and really kudos to you for mentioning that. And on this note, I also uh, re- really love those people who are kinder to others. And in fact, um, yeah, a lot of people have contributed to my success as well. So that is one common thing that I could uh, uh, resonate with you. And uh, yeah, yeah, and it, you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. And like, I, and I mean, like I, you know, and I talk about this, you know, in the book, in one of the chapters of the book, you know, I had one of my uh, um, intermediate school teachers, she thought that I was good at speaking. So we have a public speaking class that we take in eighth grade. And she really liked how well I, I spoke. 
Mm-hmm. And she she cared enough to invite the the debate coach from the high school down to come hear me. And the debate coach, you know, came down and said, you know, I think you could be a competitive debater when you get to high school. So, and, you know, which was great training to be a lawyer. I never even thought about being a lawyer until this teacher went out of her way to say, have you ever thought about debating? And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's just little things can make such huge differences sometimes. Absolutely. Especially at the early age. Like if somebody yes. is able to identify our talents, that will probably take us to a long way. Wonderful. So, Ted, you say that you and your father both struggled with alcoholism. So can you tell us about your journey to recovery? Yes. I, I, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long journey. I, I grew up, my father, you know, was an active alcoholic. Uh, mm-hmm. till the day he died from the moment I remember till the day that he died. And so drinking was a part of my life growing up. It's what men did, you know, and I, I came from a region of the United States in the South, the rural South, that was very conservative, very hyper-masculine where a man had to be a man. And part mm-hmm. of that was you were drinking. And as I grew older, you know, I was an anxious kid. And as I grew older, when I first drank for the first time it was like Naveen it was like the world was lifted off of me I felt this oh, yeah. relief mm. from that buzz of alcohol so for many many years I used it to cope and I was able to drink heavily and be a success but only for a little while by the age of 33 I had a very prosperous law practice mm-hmm. but I drank it away yep. I lost a house I lost a car I had to move back in with my parents And then at the age of 33, I went into uh, chemical dependency rehabilitation for 28 days. And I and um, and I entered a 12 step recovery program. That was my method of recovery. And so the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous were were a really big part of my recovery. And I also had to learn. I had to be honest with myself. I had to Mm -hmm. be honest that I struggled to cope that I was anxious person, that on one hand, I wanted to be very, very successful, but yet the other part of me always wanted to run and hide when there were problems. And mm. somehow or another, I had to reconcile these two, these two people that were living inside me. And over time, you know, I learned to pray and, and meditate in the mornings. And I learned to journal as we talked about in, uh, you know, in the yeah. words, I learned to journal daily. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the people that advised me early on said, as you begin your day, write down what you're afraid of and then say it out loud. Yeah. He said, if you say it out loud, it will lose its power. Mm-hmm. And, and, and then, then you say how you're going to conquer it. So instead of keeping my fears and anxieties all bottled up inside me, I began to share them mm-hmm. and I began to face them. And that's been a huge part of my recovery. And and not only that, Naveen, I've never forgotten that I'm an alcoholic. Mm. I wake up every day and remind myself because whether you're one day sober or 24 years sober like myself, we're all still just one drink away from being an alcoholic. So I have to remind myself I have to I have to do my work on a daily basis to stay sober. Mm. But, you know, for me, the, 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 the AA recovery program was helpful, having a developing a higher power that I related to. And then, then being honest with myself that, you know, I need a little help on a daily basis. Mm. So go get it. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. So, so whenever you're afraid of certain thing, I think you have to say it loud. I, I think that's a good tip. And uh, mm-hmm. because people have a lot of fears inside and they don't express it. That, that's a, This is true. Yeah. And I found it, and you may have had a similar experience, but I know that if I'm worried or stressed, or I have a problem, whether it's a law problem with, you know, here at work or whether it's with a family member. If, if I sit alone with my own thoughts, it's mm-hmm. dangerous because yeah. then it, it gets worse and worse as I roll it around in my head and I wrestle with it all by myself. Yeah. But I find if I just put it out there on the table and begin talking about it with somebody yeah. and working through it, all of a sudden the power that it had over me. Mm-hmm. begins to dissipate and I yeah. can start coming up with a solution at that point. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, I think we need to even sharing with others also subsides its power. Absolutely. And uh, you, you mentioned about uh, the South part of the country, like you said, sure. yeah, people expect ma- being masculine, right? So how did your Southern yeah. up- upbringing, upbringing 
influence your professional journey and you ended up practicing law and then becoming an author yeah well i i'll say this uh, you know so much of the book is mm-hmm. is about the conflict that i had with, with being a gay man and with and with hoping to live up to the expectations of of what a man was supposed to be you know i grew up in a region of the country where it's very conservative and the religion is christian it's a christian religion that's very fundamentalist you know if you're gay you're going to it's an abomination and you're going to go to hell and that's all there is to it and when you hear that message when you're young it brings about so much shame and you're so afraid and and you you think you're less than and unworthy of so many things so that was a big struggle for me and and uh at the time i and and you know and with my dad and with the culture that i lived in you know we have football it's not like soccer that that the rest of the world have you know we had you know american football and it's a very tough masculine sport and my dad expected me to play it and i played it and you know and it did i would say to a certain extent toughen me up but i think this more than anything this southern experience that i had helped frame the man i am today Mm-hmm. by making me realize that I had to be honest. I had to be yeah. honest with myself about who I really was and honest with the rest of the world. Because I fundamentally believe this Naveen and in and and then spend my experience until yeah. I began to be honest with the world and those around me, it was difficult for me to achieve success. If 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 you feel shame, if you don't like yourself, it's hard to be the best you can be. It's hard to accomplish success. I knew that as long as I was ashamed of myself, I couldn't be my own best friend. And mm-hmm. if I'm not going to be my own best friend in my professional endeavors, then I'm not going to succeed. Yeah. So that that played a huge, huge role for me, overcoming mm-hmm. those mm-hmm. that that ignorance and those stereotypes about gay men. Mm-hmm. That journey helped empower me in my professional life, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that that's uh uh i i, I think um, again um, so sometimes stereotypes make things but again you have broken those stereotypes and pursued your own way and uh, moving to the next one you also work as a prejudice uh, reduction trainer and did Indeed. that influence your book in any way yeah i think so uh, you know i be- i did prejudice reduction you know and here's the interesting thing mm. for me this is my story until i got sober and quit drinking and began living a life in recovery mm-hmm. I, I, i it was only then that i really began to accept myself as a gay man mm. and began sharing that with the rest of the world because as long as i drank i used my drinking to separate from others and mm. to lie to myself in my own world but when i got sober and it started my journey of honesty with myself and 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 with others and during that time i recognized that in order to hide oftentimes i would be as mean and prejudicial as some of the other people you know mm-hmm. you know i adopted their way of being so i can survive and not be found out myself and that gave me a great deal of regret once i started mm-hmm. you know so i engaged in and i learned to be a prejudice reduction trainer mm-hmm. and and so you know this is in the early 2000s that i started that work and and it was motivated kind of as my way of trying to be of service to others and to the world at large and to sort of make up for some of the things i did to keep myself safe and 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 i'm also from houston texas and as most people know houston's a very international city and we have every nationality in the world is here in houston texas and i love our diversity so so being able to 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 be and act you know to be a part of such a diverse community also excited me about doing prejudice reduction work mm-hmm. because i believe that one of the reasons that the united states continues to be a beacon for the world and we can continue to thrive is because we have so many different people from so many different places and we need to be open to all people i think <laughs> that's that's our greatness yeah that's our greatness in my mind a- absolutely i i concur with you on that like uh, or else i think country wouldn't have developed this much and it has become a great example now that uh, as us has opened everyone and there is a great great amount and great level of democracy and rest of the countries are following suit right I, yeah and i i agree and if and if and if you and if you look at yeah. so many of the of this quote unquote 
great American corporations, yeah. particularly the ones in the technological era, they're started by immigrants to America. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just I, I, I think that if, if you don't constantly have a new people and new thoughts and new ideas and new cultures being introduced, you grow stale and uh, old fashioned in your thinking and it's hard to keep up. So I, I think our, our diversity is yeah. our greatest strength. I, I truly believe that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, and I don't know how I got off on that. I'm sorry, Naveen. But yeah, I just, I did. So there you have my thoughts. <laughs> got it, got it. And, and uh, in your book, Sunday Dinners, Moonshine and Men, yes, did you sir. uncover anything related to this uh, Deep South's hidden LGBTQ plus history? I, I did. I, uh, you know, there were, there were a couple of things that I that, that I that I uncovered, mm. and, and and that is, I I, re I realized when I thought about it, you know, and I came up in that when I lived in the very rural South in North Carolina, I didn't know a single gay man. Mm. Okay, there were none of them were around, and I'm sure that they were there, but they were too afraid. They were like right. me. They were too afraid. Now, as time has changed, obviously there are more people out and open and uh, who are who are lgbtq folks yeah and and that helps a lot so what i learned is so one of the things i learned is is that it's it's i feel like as a gay man it's almost my obligation to to, to be truthful to be out yeah. mm -hmm. to share my truth with others so that there are not others who are shaming themselves and in the closet so that one of the things that i learned that the best way to conquer ignorance is to educate and the only way you can educate is to be out and open mm. and true to the world yeah. even if it means that even if it means fear i mean yeah. we experience a lot of fear we know a lot of there's a lot of hate out there but it, it's but we have to do it anyway so i think that's one of the things that i learned and things are getting a little better mm. and i think the second thing that i learned i mean when i wrote the book is despite all the work i had done in recovery in the 12 steps you know, mm -hmm. and all this work and writing I had done in recovery, I recognized by the time I finished this book, and, and the book has a lot, it's really a memoir about my relationship with my dad. I realized that I thought I had forgiven my dad for all the chaos and all the craziness that, that he had caused the family, but I hadn't yet. Mm. And it was as if this book, I, it, it was as if I had to do it to reach that point of forgiveness of my dad. And uh, because if we can't forgive the most important people in our lives, it's it's hard to focus. So I, I found it a lot easier to live in the present and to look forward to the future now that I'm not looking at the past. And, and when we don't forgive people in our past, we're constantly looking back there and they're constantly pulling us back. But we need to live in the now and be excited about the future. And by the time I was done with the book, I had forgiven my dad. He was just a human like all the rest of us and and, yeah. and i don't know that he ever intended to hurt or harm us with his chaos and with his drinking even though he did mm. but i had to forgive him for it so i could move forward yeah. and the book helped me do that mm -hmm. and and how did you come up with these interesting titles sunday dinners moon chain and men <laughs> yeah and and you know part of it is 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 the first is the sunday dinners part is i had a grandmother Mm. And my grandmother, Kirkman, who was a wonderful woman, she was one of those angels that we have in our life sometimes. And she would cook the best food. And we would always spend Sunday at her house and have Sunday dinner when I was very, very young. And I always felt safe with her. I never mm. felt as safe other places that I did with her. It was always a place of joy. So I wanted the title to have to talk about a place of joy that I experienced. Mm. The moonshine part is reflects the the alcoholism that i experienced and that my dad and i experienced in the very chaotic and tumultuous relationship he and i had and and as point of fact it ran in the family my great grandmother was made moonshine for mm. those that don't know it there was a period in u.s history in the 20s and 30s where alcohol was outlawed and people started making alcohol illegally. Well, my great grandmother was one of those people that made illegal alcohol. <laughs> and we called it moonshine down south. We called it moonshine because it was made out of corn. So mm. it was called moonshine. So the drinking and the and the illicit behavior that, that followed me and my dad over the years, it came honest to us from our grandmother. So <laughs> that's where the moonshine comes from. And the men part, 
sort of just reflects, mm. you know, my 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 learning to deal with being a, a gay man. And I, mm. you know, I had to learn to be a gay man because I had been closeted for so long. I didn't come out until I was 29 years old. Yeah. So, so that's kind of what that means. It's it it it, it sort of reflects that part of the story. <laughs> fascinating, <laughs> really fascinating. And uh, here comes the next one. Like, what do you hope readers learn about the gay experience in the deep south from your book? Number one, that you you're not alone. Number mm. one, you are not alone. You are not the only gay mm. boy out there. You're not the only lesbian young lady out there. You are not alone. Number mm. one, there's many many other people. Many of them feeling and quiet and closeted and shame like you. Okay. Number two. The only way it gets better is to go find your allies and to be true to yourself and to be honest. There is nothing wrong with you. Mm, nothing mm. wrong with you. Even if the church is wagging its finger at you, even if the culture around you says you're less than, there is nothing wrong with you. You love yourself. The South still is a very conservative place. It's still probably the toughest place to be gay in the United States. But you are not alone in you be who you are, you be honest about who you are, and there will be allies out there, and you're just fine. I, I assure you, no matter mm. what they say, God loves you. Mm. So love yourself. It's okay. Nice. I, I, I love that. And uh, uh, we had an incredible conversation so far. Now it's uh, time to add some more spice and excitement. So shall we get ready for the second rifle fire round? Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> All right, so let's dive in. Here comes my first bullet. If you could have one gigantic billboard anywhere with anything on it, what would it say? There's power in the truth and strength and goodness. There's power in truth. Awesome. And strength and, and goodness. Strength and goodness. Yes, sir. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. And uh, can you describe yourself in just one word? Yes, I can do that. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> stable. 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 Wow. And if you could meet any historical figure, who would it be? Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. Mm. And if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Uh, the power to heal. Oh. And the last one for rapid fire. What is one electronic gadget that you'd like to see or invent yourself? Uh, video football. Mm, video football. <laughs> yeah. Quite interesting, Tate. I wish that comes true. <laughs> <laughs> and let's flip back to the mainstream. What will be the key takeaway for our audience from this conversation? And or maybe you can talk about one key message about the book or about the overall the feelings about this game in in down south or anything. I, you know, here's what I hope. You know, I, I hope I hope that the number one takeaway from reading the book. Mm -hmm. is really two things, not just one, but two things. Number one is rigorous honesty. Mm. And that is, and that is first being totally honest with yourself about who you are and what your dreams are and even what you're afraid of. Be honest with yourself about what you're afraid of as much as with what your dreams are. And two, be of service to other people. I think for me, those were the two, two things that have most helped me in my life. And, and 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 a lot of people ask me, I mean, you know, what do you mean when you say rigorous honesty, Tate? And what mm. I mean by rigorous honesty, it's it's not just saying something, mm. but it's describing. It's like every time that you really mean no, but you say yes, that's not being rigorously honest. Or or anytime you see an injustice and don't speak up about it, that's kind of being it. Uh, that's not being honest either. So it means being true and honest in all things and to all people. Mm. Awesome. And how is your experience being hosted on the Guiding Voice platform? Oh, I, I've loved it. You're a joy to work with, really. I love the questions. <laughs> and, you know, I wasn't sure if I would like rapid fire, but I like rapid fire, you know, now that I think about it. <laughs> so I hope you did it. But I have had a good experience. And, 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 and y'all do incredible things. Uh, you know, I've, I've learned more about you as, as, as in the lead up to today's conversation and, and the guiding voice does some very incredible things so i hope you keep it up so keep doing what you're doing the it's it's making having an impact and it's a joy to be a part of it thanks yeah and, and thank you so much for all the kind words and thank you for your time and all the insights as well tate and uh, 
really look forward to having one more conversation with you in future you bet you got it thank you sir <laughs> thank you and uh, friends before we jump into the trivia section we have a quick request if you haven't already please subscribe to our podcast from wherever you have tuned in from because subscribing keeps you updated on new episodes and if you have enjoyed this episode and found the conversation useful please share it with at least three of your friends or colleagues or family members who would also like the guiding voice let us spread the knowledge and help others grow like you and your support means a lot it helps us create more content for you and our community thank you so much for your support and let's learn together on this journey now let's hop into the trivia segment of today's episode so today i thought i would present a few facts related to lgbtq and the rainbow flag is a symbol of lgbtq pride and was designed by artist gilbert baker in 1978 it originally had eight colors but it was later simplified to six colors red orange yellow green blue and purple and the first openly gay elected official in the united states was harvey milk who won a seat on the san francisco board of supervisors in 1977 Tragically he was assassinated the following year and the third fact is the lgbt capital is a term used to describe a city or area known for its lgbtq friendly environment and culture and examples include san francisco new york city amsterdam and berlin and the fourth one is the transgender pride flag was created by monica ems in 1999 it features blue pink and white stripes representing transgender individuals journeys as well as identities and the last one is in 2015 the united states supreme court ruled in obergefell versus hodges legalizing same sex marriage nationwide and various other countries followed the suit so my question is what you as an individual or what you as a representative of an organization are you doing to the lgbtq community and to make sure that diversity is respected i would love to hear from you in the form of youtube comments or if you have found this episode somewhere on social media leave your comment there we are going to review it for sure that's it for today's episode thanks for tuning in and being part of our awesome community we would love to hear from you folks share your ideas and feedback through our social media or email and our email address is the guiding voice for you at gmail.com and let's create content that resonates with you i am rosh navin samala a lifelong learner and my goal is to have impactful conversations that impact and improve your life as well as career stay connected as we journey together and until next time take care stay inspired and remember folks the future holds great things goodbye for now let's meet in another episode with another fantastic guest take care